Hello, and welcome to Examine Earth. Today, we're going to investigate the purpose and function of ceratopsian frills. Triceratops is probably the most famous example of ceratopsians, but this dinosaur clad is actually very diverse. Triceratops is known for its bony frill and three-horned face. Tri, three, cerat, horn, ops, face. But we'll see that not all ceratopsians look exactly like this. So why do the frills and horns vary so much, and what are the implications of that? Well, let's get some thrills from some ceratopsian frills. Oh man, that was bad. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, anyways, uh, this image shows the changes within ceratopsian frills, horns, and body size over time. It's an excellent example of coevolution, the so-called predator-prey arms race. The earlier ceratopsians are smaller bodied with smaller frills and no facial horns aside from the small cheek extensions. These basal ceratopsians were present in Asia and living alongside smaller carnivores like Velociraptor, Troodon, and small-ish early tyrannosaurs. As ceratopsians and their predators migrate into Laramidia, Western North America, they become increasingly larger and more specialized. The ceratopsian frill becomes larger and facial horns generally become more pronounced. Simultaneously, the tyrannosaurs are also increasing in body size and jaw size, along with decreasing forelimb size. The race is on. Prey gets larger and more armored. Predator gets larger with stronger jaws. And so it goes on and on. But is the frill actually armor or is it something else? If the frill and horns were purely for armor, we'd probably see ceratopsians converge on an ideal form over time what's the most effective and most durable armor to protect from predators, but that's not really what we see. Rather than converging on a single most effective form, we see a wide variety of frill and horn arrangements. There's a very general trend of enlarging frills, which seems like better defense, but you can also see the structure become a bit more fragile. Rather than becoming more robust and defensive, they are becoming more ornamented and elaborate. In the modern world where we see elaborate structures that have no obvious benefits or may even be detrimental, it's usually for display. Think of elaborate heavy antlers or tail feathers or bright colors. However, any detriment to their ability to blend in or defend themselves is offset by being more likely to attract a mate and pass on their genes. So it's been argued that the ceratopsian frills transitioned from a primarily defensive structure into a massive canvas for showing off. But did it really? How could we tell if that's what's actually happening? Uh, Fark and others in 2009 acknowledged the anecdotal evidence of this shift, but they tried to take a more quantitative approach. If these frills and horns were for protection, we'd expect to see damage. If they were primarily for display, then we would not, or at least not as much. So they looked at the frills of two very different ceratopsians. At the top here is the more robust frill and famous three horn face of Triceratops. And at the bottom here is the windowed ornamented frill and single nose horn of Centrosaurus. They looked at multiple specimens and documented the occurrence and damage of the skull and frill. The numbers here indicate the total instances of damage versus the total number of specimens observed. As you can see, Triceratops shows a much higher occurrence of damage, and it occurs in places that are consistent with engaging other Triceratops. In modern animals, defense structures are most commonly wielded against members of their own species. For example, deer, elk, moose can use their antlers against predators, but they're much more likely to use them to jostle with each other. Based on the locations and occurrence of the damage, Triceratops seem to be doing something pretty similar. Probably not the headbutting of bighorn sheep or musk ox, but the jostling of deer, or more likely similar to the horn locking of the Jackson's chameleon. However, in this month's open access edition of Scientific Reports, Dianastasio and others documented some pretty serious damage in Big John. Big John is the largest Triceratops specimen to date, and the research doc researchers documented a keyhole-shaped opening in the frill. Microscopic analysis of the bone indicates that Big John survived this encounter, and the bone was healing, but it's a great example that these battles could get ugly. 
Fossilized triceratops horns usually look sort of bluntish, but this is just the bony core. In life, the horns had a keratin sheath over the core and were longer and pointier. So do the more ornamental centrosaurs show evidence of damage like Big John's frill puncture? Looking at the damage stats, the answer appears to be no. There are a few instances of damage to the cheek, but pretty rare in general. It looks like centrosaurs were not horn fighting, which is pretty strong evidence that their frill was primarily decorative. Fark and others documented a high instance of broken ribs in these dinosaurs that indicate that they may have been flanking each other rather than jousting. This indicates that their more elaborate and ornamental frills were precisely that, ornamental. So the frills and horns are used for dominance and display, but did they protect against other organisms? Triceratops existed alongside the iconic T-Rex, the tyrant lizard king, probably the most massive and most derived carnivore to ever walk the earth. How did Triceratops protect itself from the now larger body Tyrannosaurs? Well, one hypothesis was that they didn't need to because T-Rex was primarily a scavenger. Given all of T-Rex's adaptations, though, it seems unlikely that it was exclusively a scavenger, but it's difficult to rule that out. Uh, many fossils show T-Rex tooth marks, but were these killing blows or scavenging after death? Hap in 2008 documented a Triceratops horn that appears to have been bitten off by a T-Rex. There are two deep depressions at the break, and it matches up almost exactly to an adult T-Rex tooth size and spacing. He also documented a series of tooth marks on the frill of the same individual. This is definitive evidence of a failed T-Rex attack on this particular Triceratops. This trike lived to see another day and preserved the story of the attack, possibly even multiple attacks. Another probable T-Rex attack is seen in the dueling dinosaurs fossil. It's not definitively an attack, it could be scavenging, but some T-Rex teeth are embedded in the Triceratops' skeleton. There's also some debate as to whether it was actually T-Rex or whether it was Nano Tyrannus. Are they the same animal? I discussed that debate in my last video, how many Tyrannosaurus were there. Work is underway to examine the fossil more completely in its new home, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. The fossil was found all the way back in 2006, but there was a long process to exhume it and then an even longer legal battle over who exactly owned it. That was all finally settled and it was auctioned off to the museum for $6 million. It's planned to be on display next year in 2003. They have some really cool details on their website and I encourage you to check it out. If you want more Triceratops information, please check out my free dinosaurs video course. Up here somewhere is a link to the Ceratopsia video and also in the description below. This video discusses the other Ceratopsians, including Cetacosaurus, Protoceratops, Styracosaurus, and even some more details on Triceratops itself. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see others like it, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel. You are also free to let me know in the comments below uh, what other topics you'd like to see. So that's all for today. Thanks for stopping in to examine Earth.